Fantastic. Our next speaker is Mohamed Gaudat. He's going to be talking to us about technology and creating a level playing field. Mohamed. Good morning. Uh, so I uh, get the privilege and the pleasure of uh, running Google's business in 119 emerging countries around the world. And if you can imagine with this uh, type of, uh, of territory, basically I have to travel almost all the time. Uh, back in 1999, oh, they want me in the light. There you go. Stand in the light. Back in 1999, uh, I, came, okay, I came to a realization that if I actually started to pay attention, uh, I would learn quite a lot about uh, the people uh, that I come across in all my travels. So when you, um, when you actually notice those people as people, not as background to your passage through the airport or people in the seats in a, in a business conference, you start to realize how different every indi individual is. And I actually encourage you to look at the person next to you and try even for one second or two to notice what's different about them. Uh, it's a very humbling experience when you realize at the end of the day that your way of doing things is not the only way that the world can go, and that there could be many ways where people can also be right. Uh, of course, as a Middle Eastern, uh, whose name is Muhammad Ali, I get the added perk of spending extended uh, hours in uh, passport control queues and in the uh, uh, you know, random security checks, so, uh, which, which I don't complain about, but I, I have to say, when, you, when you're there, you start thinking. You know, what is it about a Muhammad or an Osama or a Middle Eastern that uh, uh, engages that same uh, sort of reaction anywhere you go in the world? And, uh, uh, you know, when you think about it, uh, there is really no physical feature that, uh, you know, distinguishes you from the others. Maybe uh, it's, it's naive to consider that all uh, people from a certain cultural background have the same uh, ideology. Uh, I don't actually think that people are so easily uh, figured out uh, yet. Uh, you know, when you think about it, I have to say that in the last uh, few decades, we have pr probably come very close to what I call the golden age uh, of stereotyping. So I'm going to start by asking you to think a little bit. I'll give you a few examples, nothing too controversial. And I'm going to ask you to think a little bit about, uh, from your own cultural background, what is right and what is wrong. But also, more importantly, I'm going to ask you to think, uh, are there situations where sometimes both people are right or perhaps both people are wrong? So uh, let's start with this. Um, you know, if you've been to Africa, you would realize that there is a uh, native African diet that consists of uh, a type of bread, uh, dipping sauce, and um, raw red meat, uh, not even coming close to a fire. And uh, um, I normally go for the bread and the dipping sauce, basically. But uh, when you think about it, 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 uh, it, uh, it shocks you the first time you see it. But what shocks you more is why you never really notice uh, the number of um, rare steaks that are ordered at our prestige dinners, or why sushi is not uh, really an unusual at all. Um, when you think about the way we present ourselves, normally a wealthy uh, a female is associated with the image of uh, being tanned and slim, while actually in Africa it's almost the exact opposite. A wealthy lady will be a little, uh, will have a little bit of a fuller uh, um, um, uh, body because it. Uh, uh, signals abundance and will uh, probably have a lighter complexion because it signals that she doesn't have to work in the sun uh, with the poor. Uh, you know, is it diamonds or is it uh, gold uh, or are both a little overrated? Uh, I actually normally get very uh, intrigued by how, you know, the US or the UK or France would normally make fun of their leaders uh, in public. It's like a daily routine. While in many uh, West, Eastern uh, cultures, uh, perhaps Thailand, Turkey, uh, here in the UAE, we actually uh, hold a lot of respect for our leaders and would be very offended if somebody uh, um, mocks them. So uh, once again, you know, what is right and what is wrong? And um, I think the one realization I came to is that um, there is one thing that is true about every human being you, you meet. We come with this concept, uh, almost an equation pre-programmed in our system, that I am always right. And that if I am right and the other guy is different, then obviously the other guy is wrong. Now this equation has uh, grown to a massive scale in the last decade. Uh, it's moved from an individual to individual view 
uh, to a nation-to-nation -nation view, to a culture-to-culture -culture view. And I'll just take a couple of minutes to try and, uh, and ask you to think about why that is happening. Um, my view is that uh, with the spread of mass media, uh, we got a lot of uh, um, democratization of knowledge and information. I mean, think before the printing press or broadcast radio and TV, um, knowledge and information was um, exclusively held for people who had the wealth or the no royalty or the noble uh, uh, part of the, of the society. And then as, uh, as those uh, new technologies came to, uh, to our world, we started to get more and more knowledge for every one of us as individuals. The interesting thing is, as this did happen, uh, it, it increased our ability to access information tremendously uh, at all levels of the society, but it also came with a few, uh, let's say, built-in weaknesses. One of which, in my view, is that information started to be manufactured at scale. And to manufacture something at scale, you almost have to design it, you almost have to customize it, and you have to repeatedly uh, uh, get it out in, a, in the same shape and form all the time. It always has to sort of be newsworthy. Uh, or box office worthy, if you want. And that made us uh, get the information um, from a certain perspective, if you want. I think the other issue, which is really the biggest issue, is that we, with this abundance of information, did not have to seek information anymore. We just were out there, uh, and it was just a stream of constant knowledge that comes to us. And so we never doubted it. Uh, we, we just uh, sat back in what I normally call a passive information intake mode. While you're passive, you're sitting there, and what, you say, what is said to you is what you believe. And uh, unfortunately, none of us uh, started to um, doubt uh, if any of that information is really true, or if it's a single point uh, of view of the world, or in any case, if it's information that I need to verify in any case. And I think uh, what happened there is that um, uh, we got told what shampoo to use. I didn't. And we got, uh, we got told what car to drive. We got to told what, what does it took, take to, to look cool. But we also started to get told who's the good guys and who are the bad guys and who's your enemy and who is your friend. And I'm, I'm sure many of you would agree with me that uh, the world we have uh, uh, gone through in the last 10 years have seen um, a, a, um, a, a noticeable escalation in cross-cultural misunderstandings, um, sometimes leading to hate. And it's unfortunate that many of our kids today will grow up to uh, think that all Muslims are terrorists or all Americans are capitalists who will, do not, will stop at nothing to get your money or many other perceptions that are absolutely wrong. And I think it's important that something gets done about this. So why am I talking to you about this? I'm a technology guy. Uh, I'm talking about this because I actually am proud to, f to, to say that I believe my industry, the internet, is, is playing a pivotal role in changing uh, this trend and, and hopefully to the better. So I'm going to talk to you about the internet from the point of view of what does the internet do, how people interact with the internet. People interact with the internet from uh, four sides. Uh, one is they learn from the internet, they acquire knowledge, but also they communicate uh, and they participate. Uh, they take uh, part of what's happening on the internet and then they socialize. Right? So these are the human interactions with the Internet. I'll take you quickly with some, some examples on every one of them. So there is no better example on Earth uh, of the democracy of information than TED. So uh, I, we, we've heard our, uh, our morning speech around how these ideas are now available for free to the world, how we're trying to, put, to make them available for, in every language. And you would actually be amazed by the number of, uh, of views. I mean, uh, on, um, on YouTube alone, the TED channel, uh, some of the uh, uh, most uh, uh, viewed um, um, uh, talks are, have been viewed more than 1.6 million times. In total, the viewership is in the uh, high-end uh, millions. Um, with, that term, uh, with that approach to making information available, there is now a democracy where everybody around the world, wherever they are, they have the chance to get to see what you guys get to see in this uh, closed conference room. Uh, I'm a big fan of the MIT courseware, where, uh, you know, uh, or, or the iTunes U, iTunes uh, University, where now any student anywhere in the world, in India, in the Middle East, in Africa, has the same access to the same uh, information and knowledge that a person in the uh, top league universities in the world will have. So with this type of democracy, I think the only excuse that somebody has today not to get the knowledge as it really should be is their willingness or lack of willingness to acquire knowledge. Uh, it's, it goes much more 
beyond the type of information that's available on the internet. It's the scale of information that is unbelievable. Uh, it's, uh, it's estimated that in 2008 alone, 487 exabytes of information were produced on the web. Now, I'm not sure how many of you know what an exabyte is, but let's put that in perspective. A, the, the complete works of Shakespeare is five megabytes. Uh, if you fill a pickup truck of those, uh, that becomes one gigabyte, like the ones you have on your USB stick. A billion of those pickup trucks is an exabyte. Now, we produced in 2008 on the internet um, uh, uh, 487 of those. As a matter of fact, there is an estimate that all human knowledge from the dawn of humanity until the, the year 2003 came to five exabytes. In 2008, we, we, we developed eight times that much every month. Now, think about all of that knowledge and the freedom that this is bringing. Now, it, it is amazing that we at Google, we get uh, millions, hundreds of millions of users asking us more than a billion questions a day. To be able to answer that, we have to index more than 300 billion pages on the web. Now, those 300 billion pages on the web cannot be displayed in a way where we are the media programmer. We don't program what comes from the web. What we want to do is to let the web decide what's important. And technologies like PageRank, for example, is basically an equation of more than 500 million variables of who votes for which page to be the most popular and most important. That democracy, again, is that we don't get to choose. You get to choose what's important. Think of Al Jazeera, uh, an, an IP video, uh, you know, an IP um, a video over the internet allowed, you know, Al Jazeera or BBC, uh, you know, to go beyond all boundaries and all uh, elegant sponsorships, if you, uh, censorships, if you want. So people take that knowledge and they start to communicate. There has been three, 33 billion instant messages sent in the, in the year 2008, more than 200 and billion, 210 billion emails. Now, what people do, uh, you know, um, Hotmail, for example, has more than 325 million subscribers. And the difference between, uh, uh, you know, you talking to a friend and sending it on an email is an email is perpetual. It stays, you take it, you forward it to another person. And as you forward it, this knowledge goes from one person to the next. And think of how many times, you know, on your own personal email, you got a piece of information that you truly admired from, that originated originally from somebody you have no idea uh, who he is. Now, that takes you to a, a, a level of transfer of knowledge. That knowledge now is not transferred by the expert anymore. It's people telling people, people searching and finding information and sending it to the next. Twitter is the flavor of the year, and Twitter has more than 50 million subscribers. 46% uh, uh, of those would uh, uh, check for updates on a daily basis. This tells you how the new generation is so much into knowledge all the time, communication all the time. It is not about I'll wait and I'll check when I go home uh, anymore. People also participate, my absolute favorite part of the internet. The internet is not created anymore as manufactured information. Wikipedia is the largest encyclopedia on the planet, more than 130 million articles in 250 languages. Those, uh, th those articles are not produced by the experts, the scientists, the knowledge keepers, they're, they're produced by the crowd. More than 500,000 Wikipedians are vetting through that information, correcting it, editing it, and, and refining it so that it becomes the absolute repository, repository of the wisdom of the crowds. Uh, participation goes to blogging. More than, more than 250,000 words uh, get written on Blogger every minute of every day. Since 2002, there has been more than 130 million blogs created. That is more than one per second. Now, think about that. Now, your world view is no longer shaped by what you get told. It's, it, it is shaped by what other people are putting as knowledge on the web. Uh, participation with video, the, the low cost of video production. Uh, on YouTube, people uh, upload almost a day of uh, videos every single minute, 20 hours to be exact. And uh, those videos get uh, watched uh, uh, across the world um, and are uh, gaining uh, tremendous uh, momentum. You would think that they get watched in a certain part of the world. This map here shows the, uh, the distribution of uh, the, top rated the top viewed video on YouTube, mo viewed more than 130 million times 
uh, this single video around dance. And uh, this video gets viewed every world in the, uh, world, where in the world. The only white places on this map would be places that you uh, basically don't have enough internet connectivity. Uh, Kiva is my absolute favorite example of participation. Kiva is, more, uh, is, a, is a uh, uh, an organization that uh, uh, aims to fund micro loans to entrepreneurs. But the way people participate in, in charity on the internet is not by subscribing to a, a charity organization or to a cause. What they do actually is they get to know the people that they're giving to. So they get to know their story, they get to know their life pains, they get to know their dreams, and they get to know what they want to do with the money, and then they choose to participate. Kiva has given more than 130 million microloans through 560,000 uh, funders. And the beauty of this is that uh, um, uh, those people, because there is this social connection, actually pay back their loans at a rate of 98.4% higher than any financial institution in the world. This is what a social connection across cultures can do for you. I'll close very quickly with, uh, uh, with the Internet's impact on, social, uh, on the social fabric uh, of, uh, of our humanity. So Facebook today has more than 300 million subscribers. Uh, there has been an interesting survey in China recently where two, two thirds of internet users will agree that they can have a friendship uh, entirely on the web with somebody that they will never see on, in, in their life. As a matter of fact, 25% of UK teenagers online have friends that they have never seen before and will never plan to see. Uh, an interesting statistic in the US is that they ran a survey of 10,000 uh, married couples in 2006, 2007, 1,900 of them met online. The funny thing is that only 1,700 met at work or through a friend. So this is the reality of what the web is doing to our, uh, to our social culture and social fabric. Uh, places like PopTropica have more than uh, six, 76 million um, um, subscribers from 5 to 10 years of age. And places like Habu have more than 135 million subscribers that come together as a community. They consider those people their own friends, they consider that they have more in common with those people than their next door neighbor. Now I want you to put things in perspective. Uh, with those numbers, uh, Poptropica uh, is uh, now larger than the population of Germany. Uh, the uh, Habu community is uh, closing in on Russia. Facebook is almost as big as the US. And the World Wide Web in total, with at 1.8 billion people uh, online, not counting the people on mobile, is way, way beating China. Now, I say with, uh, with a lot of confidence that today's largest nation on Earth is the World Wide Web. Those people are very, very uh, 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 similar. They have a freedom of expression and a democracy of information that I did not enjoy as I grew up. They uh, participate, they communicate all the time, they shape the web the way they want. And as they do that, they get to know about the other guy not through what uh, the expert is telling them, but they get to know about the other guy from the other guy. As a matter of fact, I wanted to give you a visual view of how this is done. Uh, when you think about it, every time you get together with another person, you get to know a little bit about, uh, about them that shapes your perception. So I took you, I, I'll take you to our, uh, one of my favorite places on the web, facebook.org. And Facebook, base, uh, sorry, face, uh, faceresearch.org. Face research, uh, averages out faces to give you an, uh, an image of what would you do if you put all of these together. It honestly takes down it, all the rough edges and puts them in a very average face that I think most of you will feel familiar with. You will be okay with this person uh, and the way he looks or she looks. Now, this is what the internet is doing. I think this trend is really driving us to a place where we become much more familiar with the person on the other, guy, on, on the other side. And I really wish that this trend continues because I hope that when somebody tells my kids that the other guy is the enemy, my kids will say, I actually think the other guy is pretty cool. He's my virtual friend on Facebook. I saw his video on YouTube. And I actually think he has a very, very valid view of life. Maybe different than yours, but it's quite valid. So let me send you a link to his blog. And I hope that you will understand that, face, uh, th th that perspective too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mohammed.